Thanks, and, and thanks for coming. Um, so, as he said, my name is Sara Pulido. This is my Twitter handler. If you want to ask any questions afterwards or feedback. Um, so, for the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking about how Datadog runs Kubernetes in production. But specifically, I'm going to be talking about um, the difference. I joined Datadog just four months ago, three or four months ago. And the difference how I was doing Kubernetes before joining Datadog and how Datadog is doing it and why. Uh, so this is not a talk about Datadog itself, but just to give you a little bit of overview of what we do, if you don't know. Um, we are a monitoring company. Uh, we run a software as a service uh, to get metrics, logs, tracing from other companies. So we get a lot of data points in all the time. So we have to run a very big, responsive, and big infrastructure. Uh, but as I said, this is not a talk about Datadog. This is a talk about Kubernetes. So for those who don't know, uh, Kubernetes is an orchestration platform for containers. And it allows developers run their um, applications, containerized applications. And it has a lot of benefits like auto-healing or auto-scaling, all these things that made it so popular. Uh, it started at Google. Um, they took the ideas from their own orchestrator called Borg, and based on those ideas, they rewrote everything from scratch, and they created this open source project. Um, they donated afterwards to the Cloud Native Foundation, so it's no, it's no longer a Google project. It's, it's part of the CNCF. And it's a super successful open source project. So. It, it got 17 major releases in 2015, when it was first released. It has more than 80,000 commits and more than 2,000 contributors, and it keeps growing. So it's probably one of the most successful open source projects since the Linux kernel. And it basically seems like it's going to be continue like that. Uh, for example, last week, uh, it was KubeCon at San Diego, KubeCon US, and it, goes, it, got, it got sold out with 2,000 uh, attendees. So it's huge, it keeps growing. But it's not only popular from an open source pr perspective, also from a usage point of view. Popularity keeps growing. Uh, this is the Google Trend searches for Kubernetes in the past five years. Um, and the trend is obvious. The trend keeps growing. For now, it doesn't decrease. Um, some of you may have seen that there's some outliers out there uh, in that graph. Um, one of the things that we like doing at Datadog uh, with metrics is to put several metrics in the same timeline to try to, to easily catch correlations. And obviously, we know that correlation doesn't mean causation, uh, but in many cases, it may help us find the root cause. So I had a, 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 an hypothesis about this when I, when I first did, saw this graph. Uh, so I decided to put on the same graph the Google Trends for Mariah Carey's Holiday Classic, All I Want for Christmas. And when I did that, this happened. So as you can see, it's a perfect correlation. Um, so obviously, the root cause is that it's the holiday season. People take uh, time off from work. Therefore, they search less Kubernetes. Um, if correlation meant causation, it would mean that once a year, I don't know why, people drop everything they have to do with Kubernetes to listen to Mariah. Um, it could be, I don't know. Um, so th um, this is uh, my journey with Kubernetes before joining Datadog. So I was working for a company called Binami. Um, I don't know if you know it. They do mostly packaging of cloud native applications into VMs, containers, etc. So um, I was working two years full-time in Kubernetes teams. I'm a certified Kubernetes administrator, which is an exam that the Linux Foundation created to basically being able to demonstrate that you can write YAML. Um, I was also part of the team that created yet another certification, if one wasn't enough, called the Certified Kubernetes Application Developer. And this exam is more towards application developers who run their deployments in Kubernetes. So Kubernetes um, application developers who also can write YAML. Um, the team I was working uh, in, um, we did 
So I was working in two different teams. So it was a two smallish team. One is, was the team that was aimed to write um, applications that extended the Kubernetes API. So we created uh, projects like Cube Apps and Kubeless projects that extended the Kubernetes API uh, for people to easily deploy applications into Kubernetes. But I was also part of the team who ran uh, part of the SRE team at Binami that ran um, their Kubernetes clusters in production. And just to give you an idea of the size, uh, our cluster were about 15, 25 nodes, more or less. Um, I also ran a YouTube channel with a friend, with my friend Victor. Um, it's called Kubernetes en Español, which stands for Kubernetes in Spanish. So if you happen to understand Spanish and you want to subscribe, that's the that's a, a short URL for it. It's a YouTube YouTube channel. If you want me, if you understand Spanish, and you want me to see see myself ranting about technology. Um, so this was my journey before um, joining Datadog. So as I said early August, I joined Datadog. And because of my background, during my interview process with Datadog, I had the opportunity to, to talk to a lot of people from the SRE team uh, as part of the interview process. And we discussed um, things like Kubernetes, Helm, how they were deploying apps, how I was deploying apps, etc. cetera. And, and when I was talking to them and realizing what they were doing with Kubernetes, uh, I really I said, OK, this uh, could be a good company to join because it will give me an opportunity to see Kubernetes uh, from a different point of view, and definitely in a different scale. Um, so what a scale <laughs> are we talking here about? Uh, so just to give you an idea, this is one of our clusters. Uh, each of the hexagons over here represents a node in the Kubernetes cluster, so huge cluster, and definitely not the only one. So. Um, we run dozens of them, um, each of them with more than a thousand nodes, and also we are running on different clouds. Um, so one of the things that happens with with open source projects um, is that they get better with usage. That's that's how they get better. So people use the project, uh, they run it in production, they find a lot of issues, bugs, corner cases. Um, and they file bugs in upstream. They may even fix them themselves upstream. And that's how um, a project gets better. But what about if you run the project in a way that very few people are running it? Uh, we said that Kubernetes is super successful. Um, but for example, I found this survey. Um, that's the source of the data, if you want to check it. Uh, take it with a pinch of salt, because I think there were a lot around 500 respondents only. Um, but even so, it can give you an idea. So the, one of the questions that they asked in that survey was the, how many nodes are you running? Do you have in your cluster? Uh, so 41% of people said between one and five. Probably people that are still trying out Kubernetes. They don't know, or they just spin up a GKE cluster with three nodes, which is the default. Um, but probably nothing uh, too serious yet. Six, 10 nodes, 27%, started to feel a little bit more maybe production ready, depending on the size, uh, et cetera. And then only 4% of the people who replied to this survey said that they were running more than 100 nodes. And this is probably not the most specific data because it's just a survey, not that many responded, but it gives an idea. And it may be for two reasons. First of all, there, were, there are a lot of more small companies using Kubernetes. So they are startups. They're running from scratch. They don't have that many users. So um, they can run a smaller no, uh, cluster. And also, in the, in, for big enterprises, they haven't made the transition yet. So they may start moving some workloads to Kubernetes, but yet, no, they, they, they are not running a big cluster yet. Um, so when you start running this open source project in a way that not that many people do, you start um, maybe finding issues. So what issues? Uh, so one of the things that I want to talk about, and pro the rest of the talk is going to be talking about this, um, is that when people talk about Kubernetes, all the benefits that it brings, um, they usually avoid, or it's not part of the talk at the very beginning, 
um, of one thing that is real, that it's Kubernetes networking is not easy. Um, and that it's basically when you're running Kubernetes and you talk to people, this is the first thing that they're, they're running into. So because uh, the rest of the talk is going to be about Kubernetes networking, I'm going to give a little bit high, super high level overview of three things on Kubernetes networking. And then I'm going to drill down into each of those um, with a difference of how I was running it and why and how Datadog is running it. Uh, so the things I'm going to be talking about in this Kubernetes networking super high level 101 uh, is pod networking, service networking, and DNS. So the first thing, pod networking. So a pod in Kubernetes is the smallest unit that you can deploy into Kubernetes. Um, it basically one or more than one container that share the same network namespace. So in this graph, uh, the yellow bo boxes are pods, and each green box is, is a container. So in Kubernetes networking, pod networking says two basic rules. Um, that every pod is going to get an IP in the cluster, a unique IP, and that any pod can route traffic to any other pod, potentially. Obviously, then you can do networking rules to avoid that, but potentially um, any pod can talk to any pod. And obviously, because they share the same networking namespace, uh, containers in the same pod, is going, they are going to have the same IP. That's pod networking, very high level. Uh, the second thing is service networking. Um, pods in Kubernetes are ephemeral, so they get created and destroyed, rescheduled, um, and scheduled. They, they can happen, so you cannot trust a pod in Kubernetes. So when you have a service, for example, your application front end wants to talk to the back end, uh, it doesn't talk to the pods in the back end directly. They talk to a virtual object in Kubernetes called a service. They could have named it something else that is not so overloaded, but no. It's a service, Kubernetes service, which basically it's an IP that um, load balances traffic between all the pods that are part of that service. So, for example, in this example, if the pods on the right are your backend service, uh, your client here is a pod from your front end, uh, it will talk to a service called, I don't know, backend, and that would route traffic to any of the pods over there. Uh, the component that does that is Kube Proxy, and I'm, I'm going to explain it uh, a little bit more afterwards. And the third thing uh, is DNS. Um, so when you, t when you have this Kubernetes service, you have an IP. You could potentially talk directly to the IP, but first of all, you don't know which one it is at the beginning. It may change uh, throughout any roll-up, roll-down. Um, so instead of that, you talk to a domain name, um, and there is a component in Kubernetes called Core DNS that translates that domain into an IP. So for every service, you will have a don domain name that says um, name of the service dot the namespace where it is, in this case default, and then service cluster local, which is the, the default one. So simple DNS um, resolution. So let's start by, by talking about pod networking a little bit more. So just a recap, every pod is going to get a unique IP. Every pod can potentially talk to any other pod. Um, the, trick, uh, the tricky part here is that Kubernetes doesn't implement this at all. So this gets implemented through plugins that follow this spec. The, there is a spec called Container and Network Interface, CNI, uh, that uh, basically is a specification, part of the Cloud Native Foundation as well, that it states if you want to write one of these networking plugins, if you want to do how you have to do it, uh, there has some examples, uh, implementation examples, but in general it's just a spec. Uh, not only how you have to, to write one of these plugins, but also if you write one of these plugins, how they interact to each other, because you can mix match. To make it even more difficult, you can mix match and get some things from one plugin or the others. Um, so 
so there are many plugins that that's this. Uh, the most basic one, uh, the, where people start, is using network overlays. And because this is where people start when they don't have a lot of um, needs in terms of scale, um, this is what I was doing. <coughs> Um, the um, basically network overlays, super simple. I, I just uh, there are for, I put a couple of examples of plugins that do network overlays, like Flannel and WaveNet. Uh, in this example, I've used Flannel because it's the really the most basic one, super easy to understand. Basically, uh, it creates a network overlay uh, for all the cluster. In this case, ten two four four zero zero sixteen, and then for an Basically, every pod is going to get an IP from that network, and then um, every node is going to get a, a subnet from that network. Uh, so, the way this works um, in terms of routing, uh, this is the routing table example of the first node. So, if I want to route traffic to any IP that it fits on the uh, 1024, which is basically any pod that it's on that same uh, node. Just go to interface CNI0. CNI0 is the equivalent of a Docker bridge. Uh, so basically, it's the same that when you run Docker, uh, all the interfaces are already connected there. So the traffic will go directly. And then if it's an IP on the, on the overlay network, but not the same subnet, uh, then go to an interface called Flannel. When that happens, when it goes to interface flannel, <coughs> um, there is a, a daemon in called flannel as well. <coughs> Sorry, I'm going to drink some water. Mm. <coughs> and then um, the um, basically flannel, what it's going to do, it's going to maintain in etcd, it's going to maintain a set of um, nodes and subnets, and it's going to say, okay, this particular uh, pod is on the second node, and it's going to create a second IP packet, so an IP on IP. So it's going to create this extra header and say, OK, I'm going to send it to the second node. It's going to go through the main network interface. And when it arrives to the second node, Flannel is going to do the opposite. So it's going to remove that header and then send it again and matches directly through CNI0. So that, this is how it works. It's very simple to understand. It's simple to debug. And that's why many people start here. The problem is, is that when you scale, um, this becomes a performance issue. Um, not only because you have to have the extra header. So you have, if you have a lot of networking packages, you're basically increasing the size of those packets, but also the work of creating that IP on IP and then um, removing it also is a CPU burden. So this is the first thing that people, when it starts scaling, get rid of uh, and move to something else. So some of the alternatives um, is Calico is super famous. Calico is a plugin uh, that uses a protocol called BGP that basically what it does is sharing routing tables between all the nodes. So any road table that created in a node appears in the rest of the nodes. So in this case, what it does, it doesn't have a Docker um, bridge at all. It just have, it will create an interface per pod. So every pod that gets created in one of the nodes, it's going to create get its own interface, um, and it's going to get directly connected to the pod. And the routing is is going to look like this. So you will have like. Uh, for example, in this example, if I want to go, this is the routing table of the first node and the second node. So on the first node, it says, okay, 131, go directly to this interface that we saw it was directly uh, connected to it. Uh, if I want to go to two, uh, 129, then my next hop is going to be 0 0.2. How they do, uh, how they know this, how they share it, it's through that protocol, BGP. Um, this is this works um, specifically when you're running bare metal. Uh, so people who are running on-premise Kubernetes are using this. Uh, but the problem on that when you're running in the cloud is that basically you're 
replicating what the cloud is already giving you. So this is a little bit of a uh, software defined network. So when people uh, start finding these issues, uh, if you're running in a cloud, another way to do this is direct pod routing. And this is what, uh, what Datadog is using today. Um, there are many plugins that do direct pod routing. Um, specifically for AWS, uh, there is EKS. Um, EKS is the plugin that AWS uses for their Kubernetes platform, managed platform, which is called EKS but they also open source the plugin that they use. So you can, even if you're not running AKS, you can use it. And also Lyft, the taxi company, um, they're, they wrote their own plugin and they, they have it. So in this case, what they do is that they basically reuse all the networking of the cloud um, and they get, they give every pod an IP on the VPC. So basically every, and then, and therefore, um, it matches what the two rules that we set, because obviously through the VPC um, you're going to be able to route any traffic from, from pod to pod, but also from pod to anything that is on your VPC. So if you have a hybrid system uh, with some VMs and some Kubernetes, uh, your pod will be able to talk as well to any other pods, uh, to any other VM as well. Uh, so the first takeaway that, that I saw is that um, if you're running Kubernetes, be ready to also be an expert of the CNI plugin of your choice. Yeah, super exciting. Something else that you can put on your CV. Um, yeah, this is something your operations team will need to understand how it works because at some point it will fail and you will need to know exactly how it's working. Um, Second, service networking, just to recap. Uh, so we have this component called Kube Proxy that basically load balances traffic uh, from uh, this object called a service to, a, to the pods that are part of that service. Thankfully, good news, this is actually implemented to, with, in Kubernetes, so you don't have to deal with plugins if you don't want to. You can, because there are plugins that actually replace Kube Proxy, but if you don't want to, you don't have to. Um, but there are two modes that QProxy runs. So the first mode, the full one, uh, this is if you if you install Kubernetes, this is how it's going to work unless you say you tell it something else. And because it was the default, this is how I was using it. Um, the basically how it works is QProxy is a component running on every node of your cluster, and it's watching the Kubernetes API all the time for. Uh, pods that get created, pod that gets destroyed, uh, services that get created and destroyed, um, pods that become uh, available to join a service. All these things is watching all the time. And basically, what it's going to do is going to update the um, IP tables, NAT table of that node. So when a pod wants to talk to a service, um, it will basically go through their NAT table. This is a, an example of the IP tables NAT table for a node. And uh, the first rule is the one that matches the IP of the service. So it will match there. Then it will move to these two change rules. Um, so it will match any of the two rules over here with a 50% of uh, probability. And then one of the examples, if you can see it down here, um, just for one of the rules, because the other one is the same, matches the IP of the pod. So, again, very simple, um, very easy to debug because you can get the uh, table very easily, but it has some issues. So, IP tables, the night table grows linearly with pods and services, so that table will keep growing every time they create a pod, every time you create a service. Another issue is that for every change, you have to resync the whole table. So um, every time that you create a service or a pod or an endpoint, all these things are going to resync all the table. And also, uh, there are no only complaints from a, a user point of view. So the, the, the Kubernetes developers themselves uh, were complaining a little bit about this because there is no more room uh, for features. So if they want to improve how Kube Proxy works, 
Um, using IP tables, there are not much else that they can do. Um, so this is why IPVS mode came in. This is what Datadog is using. Uh, IPVS mode is GA since 111, so if you're running 111 onwards, it's stable, you can do it. It's not default, but you can do it. Um, some benefits. It has atomic changes, so you don't have to resync everything, so you just have to change the rule that matches whatever change you've done. Um, IPVS was actually written, it's another Linux feature, so uh, it was actually written for load balancing algorithms, uh, sorry, for load balancing, so it uh, implements different algorithms, so you can actually not just randomly select a pod, but you can do things like wrong robbing or list connection, etc. And also the complexity doesn't grow, so it, it remains stable no matter how you grow. And this is an example of how it looks the admin tool that they have uh, to debug, so also very easy uh, if you need to debug something. Um, so when, when to move to IPVS? So uh, one of the things, obviously it's GA since 111, so if you're running 111 onwards, hopefully you are because 111 is already um, a little bit old. Um, if you're running 111 onwards, it's GA, you can do it, but it's still not default. And we are going back to the thing about open source projects, that the more usage they get, the better they get. So it's still not default, that means that many people are still using IP tables, so probably IP tables are more stable, in a sense. So basically it's up to you. Um, Calico made this uh, load testing, um, test of, of running IPVS versus IP tables, and then they found out that both in latency and CPU, the numbers will start getting uh, much better, uh, starting at a thousand services. So it's their numbers. You probably would need to run your own uh, to see how it works for you, but it seems like around a thousand services, f at least for them, uh, meant that IPVS was running a lot better. Uh, so, the second takeaway, uh, many large deployments are already moving to IPVS. Datadog is IPVS already. Um, the um, Laurent Bernay, which is uh, uh, an engineer at Datadog in the Kubernetes computing team, he was talking to at KubeCon uh, a couple of KubeCons ago to several people who were running large Kubernetes deployments, and the common thing is that most people were already moving to, to IPVS for very large deployments. And also there are new solutions being developed. So there is this company called Cilium that they're creating um, a plugin, a CNI plugin, that also replaces kubeproxy. Um, and uh, they're using another technology called eVPF. Uh, so there are things that are moving uh, innovation here. And finally, DNS, the default is here, core DNS translate, I was here, but there were some issues. So this is a very famous bug in Kubernetes. Uh, people were finding exactly five second delays on DNS uh, when they were growing a lot. Um, this was um, a race condition, it was fixed, but people were finding issues when, when they were using DNS. So. Um, a solution that people came up with is using a DNS cache. Datadog was using this. Uh, it's actually using this. Um, so Datadog created this by themselves. So what we do is that we run DNS cache on every single node. So when a pod on that node wants to talk to, uh, to a service, they will go first to DNS cache. And if it's a miss, they will then only then talk to core DNS and they will reduce the traffic to core DNS and reduce the, the uh, probability of having a race condition with DNS. Good news, uh, Kubernetes is catching up. Uh, they've introduced this feature, node local DNS cache. Uh, it's part of Kubernetes now. It's beta on 115. So if you're running 115 onwards um, and you are happy with beta features, you can already um, use this, uh, and probably at some point the dog will move to this as well because it's always 
better to, to use something that is part of Kubernetes rather than having to, to maintain ourselves. Uh, so some takeaways, uh, just to recap. Probably these are the take a little bit of the takeaways that I found over throughout my years at, in, with Kubernetes and when I started talking to the people in Datadog. Um, first, bad news. There are some bad news to learn. Um, Kubernetes is flexible for developers, uh, but it's still pretty complex for operations. So something that to, to take into account. So it's not going to be a, a free ride. It's not going to be super easy. It has some benefits depending on the type of problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, the second bad news is CNI plugins work very differently between one another. So be ready to learn yours specifically because you will need to debug issues at some point. And certainly you will hit bugs, especially if you're doing Kubernetes in a way that less people are using Kubernetes. Um, and a little bit related with the CNI plugins thing that learn yours, um, many of the issues that we'll you will find will be part of your CNI plugin and not part of Kubernetes, so something that you need to to know where to investigate on the CNI um, a specific GitHub repo instead of Kubernetes, all these things. But there are a lot of good news as well. Um, the ecosystem picks up very quickly, uh, just like we saw with IPVS, DNS cache. So there are a lot of people working in Kubernetes full time. There are a lot of companies putting a lot of money into Kubernetes. Um, it's an open source project that is super su successful because there are a lot of money. So that means that, um, yeah, it will it goes very fast and these issues get solved very quickly. Another good news, the development experience doesn't change man much. If you change those underlying things, like if you change the CNA plugin or you change uh, Q proxy mode, all this, these things from a developer point of view, it's going to be the same thing. So um, maybe they have to change some annotations or not, depending on how you deploy these things. But in general, it's going to, to be the same. So a little bit related, changes don't have to happen uh, at the same time. So you don't have to do this big uh, transformation prior that last two years because you want to do something else. Uh, you, could, you just can spin up another cluster, uh, make the changes that you want to make, start moving workloads step by step um, until until you're happy and and that's it thank you very much uh, we're hiring so if you think that this is interesting and you want to uh, help us run very big Kubernetes clusters uh, let me know thank you <laughs> any questions Um, yeah, there are many. <laughs> security is another one. Security, uh, it's it's another another one. Um, especially if you want to to have clusters on, for example, on different um, ASONs. Um, so as soon as you cross things, you have to be very careful about security. And Cilium is a is a very good example. Cilium is a plugin that it's worth having a look if you have that issue. If you have uh, to have multiple uh, availability zones because they take security into, into account. They have everything encrypted. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much.